This video is going to discuss the rule for naming ionic compounds that contain a metal with only one cation. So before we get into the rule, I want to think about how would we know when to apply this rule. So the first thing we need to think about is how would I know that something's an ionic compound? And we talked about this, that ionic compounds are made up of metals and nonmetals. Metals are on the left side of the periodic table, and nonmetals are on the upper right hand corner. Now, metals form positive ions, or what we call cations, and nonmetals form anions, which are negative ions. And so ionic compounds have positive and negative ions coming from metals and nonmetals. And in a previous chapter, we talked about the transfer of electrons and how we would predict the charges for the main group uh, elements using the octet rule. So that's the first thing we need to think about is, am I looking at an ionic compound? And then the second thing in this um, title here that I would consider is what does it mean to be a metal that only forms one cation? So to illustrate this, I um, included this reference table, which you can get in your canvas shell. And in this reference table, it's just, uh, it's a periodic table, but it um, has ions. So we know the tall columns, those are the representative elements, and those are the ones that are the main group. Representative and main group are the same. These are the elements that we can predict the charge of with the octet rule. And we did spend some time um, uh, understanding that group 1A forms a 1 plus, 2A forms a 2 plus, and if you look down these columns, you see that there's just one. 3A forms a 3 plus. 4A, um, we would predict 4 plus, 4 minus, um, but the ones that would, would do a minus charge actually are so small, the nonmetals, they don't have charges. And then we have our anions, the nonmetals. So we have a 3 minus, a 2 minus, and then um, a, the halogens are 1 minus. The noble gases don't form ions. So this stair-step line here, this is what separates the metals and the nonmetals. So up to this point, we've really only talked about metals with only one charge. And I like this periodic table because it has the charges within the elements box. And so you'll notice that the um, main group elements, especially group 1A and 2A, they all just have one charge. Now, the, some of the transition metals, which are in here, some of them have one charge, but you'll notice that there's several that have multiple charges, so two, more than one. So this particular rule is focusing on any element, whether it's in the main group or in the transition metals, that only has one charge. So for example, it could be silver, or it could be zinc, or it might be calcium. These elements only form one cation, and that's what this rule applies to. So here's the rule. You name the cation, followed by the name of the anion. So here's something with ionic compounds. All ionic compounds use this basic rule. We're gonna name the cation, followed by the name of the anion. In ionic compounds, we don't use prefixes or anything to indicate how many elements are present, because in ionic compounds, um, the charges tell us the formula. So if I'm looking at this rule that I wrote, name the cation, followed by the name of the anion, then I would think, okay, well, how do I name the cation? And here it is.
So the cation is named the same as the element. So another way to say it is metals are named the same as their element name. So for example, a calcium two plus is called a calcium ion. And even a transition metal like zinc that forms a two plus would be called a zinc ion. Uh, a sodium ion would be called a sodium ion. And a transition metal silver, which only forms a positive one, would be called a silver ion. So if uh, the name of the cation, when the element only has one cation, is just simply the same as the element name. Now the anions are a little bit different. And remember, the anions are going to be uh, the nonmetals. And so we will look down here. So for the nonmetals, and maybe I'll write that underneath it. These are the nonmetals. And then uh, up here, the cations. These are going to be metals. It might be repetitive, but I find in naming, you can't repeat something too often. So anions, you see here the rule says, use the stem of the element name. And in chemistry, when they're talking about the rules and the elements, the stem is just like the main part of whatever the element name is. It's really the beginning of it. Um, they call that the stem. So you use the stem of the element name, but you change the ending to I-D-E. So for example, chlorine would have an ion that's called chloride. Sulfur, its ion would be sulfide. So when they're referring to the stem, they're talking about this first part. So if you look at chlorine, that's what they mean when they're talking about the stem or sulfur. And sometimes sulfur uses the whole word sulfur, especially like in acids. So they always like to throw little things in on us. Um, what would be another one? Phosphorus. So phosphorus would be phosphide. So again, to name the anion, you take the stem of the element name and change it to IDE. So let's look at the rule again. It just says name the cation followed by the name of the anion. So what we're going to do is we're going to name the metal, and it will be followed by the name of the uh, nonmetal with the ending changed to IDE or IDE. So I have several examples so we can see if we're understanding. So looking at these examples, I would do, this is sodium. So I'd say sodium. Then oxygen would be oxide. This is magnesium. This is fluoride. Aluminum. sulfide. Now, while the, uh, the first three examples, the metals were, were all main group elements, and so they only form one charge. But silver and zinc are in transition metals. So when you're first learning uh, naming and you don't really have uh, a big knowledge of which elements form more than one cation, you may need to use this reference table that I gave you. So you might then want to look up silver and see that it only has one charge. So we're going to call it the silver ion. And zinc only has one charge, so it will be called zinc. So this would just be silver, chloride. And this would be zinc, phosphide.
Now, what I would like to do is uh, remind you before we leave this, uh, how you put the formulas together. So uh, let me think of uh, a couple, let's look back. I wanna see another one that has only one charge. What about, um, let's see, I hate to spell molybdenum. That would just seem awful. Why don't we could do cadmium? Okay, let's try. So if I have cadmium, um, bromide, that will be one we'll do. Then let's do barium. Oxide and um, let's see, uh, car calcium. Let's do calcium nitride. All right. So when you're given the names of the elements and you're asked to get the formulas, we identify this as an ionic. Uh, compound because it has a metal and a non-metal. And the only way to get the formula is to know the charges. All right. So cadmium, if that would be one you might not be familiar with. It's a transition metal. We can't predict the charges from the periodic table. So if we go back here, I chose this. We see cadmium is a two plus. So cadmium is a two plus and bromine is a halogen and the halogens are a one negative. So in class, we talked about the crossover. You know, ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the positive and negative charge cancel out. And so in this case, if you have a two positive and it's only a one negative, the bromide, you're going to need two of those. Remember, in class, we were using a shortcut, and it's not moving the charges around. It's not doing anything like that. It's just a shortcut to quickly figure out how many you need to cancel. So to figure out how many cadmium, you can look at the opposite charge. So bromide has a 1, so I need 1 cadmium. And then to figure out how many bromides I need... I look back here, and since cadmium has a two, I need two of them. So that's how I get the formula. So let's try the next one. Now, barium and oxygen are both rep, uh, main group elements. So um, barium is in group 2A, so it has a two plus. And oxygen is in group 6A, which is a two minus. Now, if you're not feeling comfortable with predicting the charges of the main group elements, then you need to go back to the previous chapter and um, review how we predict their charges with the octet rule. Okay, so at this point in this chapter, we should be coming familiar with that and have a comfort level that allows us to do what we're doing right now. So barium has a two plus and oxygen has a two negative. And if you recall, we talked about if the charges have the same value, like in this case, they're both twos, then it only takes one of each for those two charges to cancel. So barium oxide looks like this. And then finally, calcium, which is under is above barium, and calcium has a two positive, so they're in the same group. They have the same charge. Nitride is in the 5A, and they have three negatives. So to figure out the charge when they're not the same, I can use the little uh, shortcut. So for calcium, I would need three of them because nitride has a three, so it's going to take three calcium to cancel that nitride out. And then nitride... I look back here, and calcium has a two, so it's going to take two uh, nitrides. So if you're given the name of an ionic compound in order to predict the charges, I mean, sorry, in order to predict the formula, you have to figure out the ions. So let me just, one thing before I leave this video, to make sure you're getting it, this, when I say name, this is the name. 
When we talk about ions and what charges they are, these are the ions. And this over here is the chemical formula. Okay. So from a name, to get the formula, you have to have the ions. That's how we know how they go together. Okay, so hopefully that will help you get started. If you have any questions or an example that you'd like to see or are struggling with, then send me an email and I'll be happy to help you out.